Welcome, Lee. Mute. Unmute. Hi, everybody. I'm Lee. I'm an alcoholic. Um, Lee Y from up in the sky. The uh, and it's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much, Sherry. And uh, no, Sherry, I got she knew my kid when she was three, so it must be 22 years. And John F up there watched my kid grow up, you know, always special to her and special to me. And uh, so it's wonderful seeing you guys and meeting new friends. My sobriety day is November 20, 1984. Uh, I'm forever a member of the Central Group. And uh, the uh, other than that, I have a sponsor. His name's Steve V. He lives in Jacksonville. He's got what I want. He loves God. And uh, he's not, and he has a good life. And he's very active. And I like him. And uh, other than that, I guess, uh, let me briefly qualify. I think that's the next thing. Uh, uh, my name is Lee. You just call me inmate 65713, white male. Uh, there's still people that are call me Glenn. Anytime, any judges or lawyers, it's my first name, Glenn. So uh, you, if any of you have that experience, any of you been, you know, I don't have to talk about it. You know, you hadn't been, you don't want to know. And uh, the... Uh, I was a guy that when I drink alcohol, I cannot control the amount of alcohol I drink. Something happens to me when I add alcohol to my body. I develop an unquenchable thirst for alcohol. I can't explain that. I don't know why that happens, but it was always that way for me. And I was a guy that needed a drink when I finally got, you know, when I was in my early teens and I finally got up to alcohol and I was ready. And it was just like uh, throwing a match in a bucket of gasoline. Whoosh. You know, I took off. I had this deal. I'm a big book alcoholic. David A. said there's three kinds of alcoholics in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Drinking alcoholic, sober alcoholic, and dead alcoholic. And I fit in right there. I am everything this book says. Now, as bad as it is to drink alcohol uncontrollably and, to, you know, to overdo it when I drink it, I got another problem. It's my main problem. The book calls it my main problem. I have a problem with my mind. You know, I have a mental problem. And because uh, when I'm not drinking and I've got every reason not to drink and I shouldn't drink and I've all, I agree that it's a bad idea. All of a sudden, having drink alcohol comes the best idea I've had in a long time. And I'll go out and I'll have a drink of alcohol. Boom. I'm in all the trouble I was. The, the last time I swore off forever, it got so bad for me that I came to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's pretty bad. I think we're the last stop, and uh, but I'm happy to announce that as a result of coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, getting a copy of this book, and doing the following suggestions in that book under guidance of a guy named Roy. I have not had a drink of alcohol in 38 years. That's a miracle. One day at a time. And uh, Roy took me through the steps when I was released. And uh, I did the steps as best as I could while I was incarcerated. I got my first couple calendars in Florida State Penitentiary. I, a guy named Jerry W. came in county jail, Vietnam vet. Uh, came, he thought there might be somebody there. He wanted to bring a meeting to men and women that could not get a meeting for themselves. And uh, Jerry had never been in jail, never had any trouble like that. Jerry embraced that idea that Bill Wilson gave us. We don't help other alcoholics because they're alcoholics. We help other alcoholics because we're alcoholics. And uh, Jerry brought that to me. I think Abby brought that to Bill. And uh, somebody brought it to you, just like that. And so I, uh, I got a copy of a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. I wasn't a big reader, guys. I hung out with. We didn't hang around libraries. And I said, "Well, I'll try to read this book, you know." But another thing happened for me. I went to lockdown seven times. I was an unruly person. 
I, I was uh, the way alcoholism acted out in my life when incarcerated prior to Alcoholics Anonymous is I would go crazy. There was no alcohol, but I was in county jail, went locked down seven times real fast because I just couldn't manage my emotions. And I've become very excited and agitated and hostile with other guys just sitting there trying to do their time, I guess. And uh, so seven time in lockdown, guy, another inmate may in AA talked to guard into bring me a tape player. And a tape. of a little girl that said she all her life, she just wanted to die. I just want to die. Why can't I die? And man, I said, I want to die. Let me die. Let me die. Please let me die. I was going back to prison for the third time. And I knew what my life was. And, but later in her talk, she said she just graduated from college and had been accepted to law school. And her name was June G. And I said, AA can do that. Could AA give me a life? Not just not drink and be miserable, but to, to have a life, to have something good, to be like my relatives, my, my family, to not be the guy I was. The last three years of my drinking, man, I, it's progressive. I started drinking, but it was bad. It blackouts from the get-go. It's like time travel, dancing on the dance floor, down at the Waffle House, eating a waffle, laying between two cars in the parking lot. Screen off my window, beer cans everywhere. I'm in bed almost, you know. I got I got that from the get go. But later, man, when I was 27 years old, it was wake up in the morning, get the money, get loaded, get loaded, 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 get the money, get loaded, get loaded. And uh, I committed crime. And that's what I did. And uh, I uh, they give you deals. I got a good deal in Little Rock. <laughs> I confessed to 86 felonies. They told me to leave Arkansas and never come back. I went to Florida, and then over the next 10 months, I confessed. I committed 135 armed felonies. Because every day, my thought, my mind, get the money to get loaded. Get loaded. And the combination of all that, what that added up to was me and being in a lockdown cell wishing for death, begging for death. And I heard a little girl that said, hey, I can keep you sober and give you a life. So when I came out of lockdown that time, I was, I had something to, I had a new focus. And I ran up to Jerry, the guy brought the meetings in, just asked him, please help me. And, uh, that's a good prayer, by the way. Help. Help me. Many times, help me has meant just take me, take all of me, take everything that this is. Do something, remake me. Do something with me. Do something with this thing here. And now more often, it's use me. Please use me somehow. God, man, if I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I was useless. God, how useless. And one of the promises is it will become useful. Man, AA's made me useful. God made me useful. The uh, Anyway, I, I uh, ended up going to Florida State Penitentiary, and uh, we uh, judge sentenced me, meanest judge there, me, most worst judge in the county, you know, Dominic J. Salve, terrible judge, mean judge. He jumped outside the guidelines and gave me extra time because there was such a victim outcry in the courtroom. My grandmother screamed. So 
So, uh, I uh, went to penitentiary and there uh, looking for AA, got there. Uh, I wrote the judge a letter and told him that some guys and I got together and we started a meeting. And uh, we called it the end of the line group. And so I had sober buddies, had a sponsor in prison, Cliff. When I got my year, he gave me his chip. Had a sh Someone had drilled a hole in it and he had a shoestring and wore it around his neck. He took it off his neck and gave it to me. I've still got it. And uh, we started trying to do the steps, you know, me and these guys. And, you know, you do as much of the nice step as you can do while incarcerated. A lot, some of it you have to wait for. But I learned how to take inventory, look at things in a different way. We're going to look at this in an entirely different angle. And uh, then uh, I start, that's where I started trying to implement and practice the 11th step. And that's what I'm here for today. So let's get started on that. It's two pages, by the way. You can read it real quick. And uh, you want to get somebody busy in the 11th step, ask them to speak on it. <laughs> they get busy. The, uh, you got a sponsor, he needs to do a four step, ask him to go to the meeting and speak on it. <laughs> the, uh, I have, I started trying to implement the 11 step. It suggests prayer and meditation. And if you start reading, it looks like three inventories uh, when we retire at night. And then some followed by some questions. Now, I don't, I, I used to ask myself those same questions. Now, today, it's, it's uh, I those questions, you know, do I owe an apology? Have I not been kind? Very often, if I'm not ready, I will not be kind. I have to be ready. You know, they're out there to get you. And you got to get ready. And on awakenings, when I start getting ready, because they're out there and they, they're they going to get you if you're not ready. And so I try to start getting ready for my day. I ask myself questions. More often today, it's uh, God prompts me. And the reason for all these inventories and all these questions and all this stuff is so my house can be clean enough that God can use me in a maximum way. That's what I believe. That seems to be the the object of it all to me is God wants to use me. And if I'm cluttered with all this stuff, I won't be effective for God. I, I can't hear God, but I can hear him when I, when I get clean and get down and I make a list. My evening thing is usually me making a little list of things so I can unclutter my life and unclutter my being and just so I'll be present. In the mornings I do, I, for many years, I like to, Keith Lewis, he's, he's passed away. He would, he said, man, I can't do that. I got to go to the restroom when I wake up. And he'd go in there and he'd, on his mirror, he painted, you're wrong. He go, go, oh, thank God I'm wrong. Because everything I was just thinking is, you know, I'm so glad I'm wrong. And uh, he, uh, he was a very helpful guy. The, uh, but uh, we do these inventories in the 11 steps. And then it says, and then basically, you know, then I can pray and, and meditate with effectiveness. That's how it works for me. And I'm just going to tell you how I do this stuff. You guys do what you want. Uh, here's what's worked for me. And here's, and I'll give you some of the evidence of it's working for me. 16 minutes. I, uh, when I was in prison, I was on the compound. The opportunity to practice the 11 step was always, you know, get up real early for everybody else and get out on that compound. You know, you got guys all around you. There's a lot of noise. But on the compound, if you get out there early enough, there'd only be a few people out there. And so what I would do is I'd walk the yard. And uh, while I'm walking, I would pray. And I'd talk to God. And I was trying to do that. And uh, one day I was out there. I was just talking to God. And I don't know. You know, I just realized that I was happy and I, I didn't I didn't I wasn't sure what it was because I had never remembered ever being happy and the thought hit me 
that it was okay to be me. It was okay to be who I was. And uh, I realized that perhaps my roots had grass, new soil, and that God was present into my life, in my life. And uh, the idea that God does not give us pain, suffering, or sorrow came to me, that God had something good for us, and that uh, he would give us the strength to endure tough times, because I was in a tough time. But I believe I had the strength to endure it because he was with me, very present. So anyway, I, uh, I became a different guy while incarcerated. I never went back the whole, started saying third step prayer, just enough, just enough of a prayer to not be completely insane and get started. But, uh, I wrote the judge a letter. I'd gotten a book, meditation book from this nurse in the clinic, uh, what, the prophet. And I'd, I mean, I just read it, you know, and I wrote the judge. I was writing him, you know, told him about it, started a meeting, you know, told him that, that, uh, you know, quoted something in crime and justice out of that book by that guy. And uh, next thing I knew, a couple of weeks later, uh, they called me and told me to ro roll it up, that they were going to take me back to court. And I got, man, I got some more charges. He'd already jumped outside the guidelines, gave me extra time. And uh, when they came to get me, two sheriffs from Seminole County, where I was going, said, well, they drive up here. Usually they don't tr transport you like that. And they were pilots and they'd sent a plane for me. And they don't send planes for guys like me. They send planes for guys like Noriega. And guys like that. So all the compound, they sent a plane. For, who is that guy? Superintendent Warden. Who is this guy? What? They sent a plane for this guy. Who is he? Have we missed something? Let me see that guy's jacket. And uh, I, uh, they flew me back and uh, went, stood in court before Judge Salpy. And uh, evidently, he liked that book. <laughs> And uh, and it touched, it meant something to him. And that something about some, I don't know, just God doing for me what I could never do for myself. He cut my sentence in half. Took me, took all, took, you know, like took away, just changed the whole sentence. Thing. Took away all that money I owed, restitution, all the community service took away just really restrained and then sent me back i finished up just a few more months and ended up only doing two years and uh so you know i could see god working just i, I mean god's working in my life god's here in my life so man you know i got out of prison and uh man i needed a job i didn't know how to do anything so uh you know you know, we're going to pray for knowledge, God's will for us and power carried out. But I tell you what, sometimes I just prayed for other stuff, too, you know, because praying become a big part of my life by then. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's good for everybody that I would have a job, not just me. My God, they they want me to have a job. That P.O. wanted me to have a job. And uh, he, made, he he was real serious about me getting a job. So, you know, uh, I, uh, I was in a meeting once. A little girl was a nurse. She said, I love being a nurse. Uh, I think God put me on earth to be a nurse. And I wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I'm so excited to go be a nurse. I just lay there. I can't go back to sleep. And I just think about being a nurse, being a nurse, being a nurse. I said, God, I don't, I hate my job. I don't feel that way at all. And uh, so I started praying about that. I said, God, did you put me here? What did you put me here for? Do you have something for me like that? I, I want to be useful. Give me something. Is there something I can do that could help people? She helps people. I want to help people. I want to be a guy that, that just to help a lot of people. And anyway, 11 months later, I was selling raffle tickets at a conference. And this old man walked by with some boxes and asked him, wanted me to help him carry those boxes. And uh, 
The next month, he said, I'll be in Daytona. You want to come help me there? You can help me there, too. I thought the old guy wanted me to carry boxes for him. <laughs> so I got there, and he brought me over and set me down in front of some equipment. And uh, that was 29 years ago. And uh, I didn't know the guy was teaching me something. I didn't know that that, that would become a career. And that I would do something that would put me in the middle of AA. And that I would get letters from people from all over the world. Thank you. And for what I've been able to get to do. And let me tell you this. If you love what you do and you're doing it for God, it's like being on vacation. Sometimes I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and I'm so excited. To get to go do what I get to do. I just lay there. I can't go back to sleep. The uh, meditation is something, you know, I don't know how you guys do it. But uh, I just try to listen to God. Now, Sandy helped me so much. We had Sandy right in the neighborhood. And Sandy was big on this stuff. And so, you know, I benefited greatly because of these men, you know, around me. and. Uh, what I do for meditation today and have for some time is I just try to get now, whatever it takes, the mountains help, the ocean helps, but just laying down for me and breathing in and out and just try to be present right where my breath is in, out, right here, right now. Sandy said, that's where God is. There's one that has all power. May you find him where now, when now. So I want to get now. You know, where God lives, there is no time. God's not bound by time. We're, God never has to wait. It's always right now with God. So I want to be where God is. And I think when I do that, and I think he loves it. I think God just loves it when I do that. When I'm seeking him in the present. My little daughter, when she was three years old, I was laying on the couch, and she was tiny, and she came over to the couch, and she picked my big arm up like that, and got under my arm on that couch and laid down next to me, put pressed her back against me as close as she could get, and pulled my arm over around her and held it just as tight as she could. Because she wanted to be that close to me. And man, I'm going to tell you, I was filled. I loved that kid. But at that moment, it was like I was filled with joy and filled with love. A love, more love than I ever felt in my life. That that baby wanted me to hold her and wanted to be close to me like that. And I was thinking, man, I just, and I was just, the thought came into my mind, God, is that how you feel about me? Is that how you love me? Do you long to be close to me the way I long to be close to my child? In that instant, whatever my relationship with God was, it grew a hundred times. You know, our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson said he is the father of lights. Bill Wilson said he is the father. We are his child. In the closing of Dr. Bob's story, Dr. Bob said our heavenly father will never let us down. And for me, that became real to me at that time. And a lot of things started changing for me from that day until now. Uh, because of this closeness and this special relationship that I felt. Uh, I keep, you know, I like the prayers in the big book. I like the prayers. Uh, and, but I'll tell you a good prayer. Thank you. That's one of my favorite prayers. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. I uh, heard a story. Guy in AA used to tell, he's gone. He said, St. Peter was up in heaven. God said, come here, St. Peter. St. Peter came over to God and said, yeah. Okay, how is it today? What, what are they doing today? What, what do they want now? He goes, oh, man, it's the same. It's the same thing. They want, a, they want somebody to act right, and they want some, you know, they want this, and they want that, and, you know, they're very this." discomforted because of how they whether it's not just happening the way they want it and stuff like that and he goes yeah same old stuff he goes yeah no 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 it's not the same because there's one guy in florida and all he says is thank you thank you thank you he goes, really huh Give that guy anything he wants. Don't hold back anything. Give it all to him. And I think I got it all. I don't think there's anything that you can have out of this deal that I have not gotten. And I'm so, I'm so grateful. They say gratitude is the hinge on which sobriety swings. I've never seen a grateful alcoholic get drunk. Sometimes all we have to do is say thank you and to ignite that inside of us. We don't have to look very far to see very much, very much. I like being in an AA meeting. People say, I don't know about God. I say, look around you. Look at the guy next to you. You're sitting, like Larry T says, man, you're sitting in the middle of the evidence. I mean, there's no greater evidence than just right, just right here what I'm seeing right now. Man, a bunch of psychos, nuts. <laughs> the worst people in the community. You know, God, I was. They just like me, just like me. Oh, just like me. Uh, mental illness, circus has left town, monkey's still on my back. I got to do this stuff every day. I've got two minutes left. I think I had one more thing. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you this. Uh, March 13, 2019. I was 34 years sober. Governor Ron DeSantis' uh, office called me and asked me, to uh, appear before him at the Capitol. And uh, I called Judge Salpy told him. He said, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming with you. He's an old man, meanest judge, meanest judge there is, old man. He stopped three times as we went up the steps of the Capitol. <laughs> Sit down. So we could make it. And we got before about 300 people there. And uh, Judge Selfie said, I'll talk. Let me talk. Let me talk. You could barely hear him. He's so weak. And he said, I've known this guy 34 years. He wrote me a letter and I cut his sentence in half. I sentenced him to a year in county jail. I laid him out after two months. I took away $37,000 in fines and 500 hours community service. And then I wrote Judge, to call Judge Dickey and said, I let him off that 20 years paper after four years. And I've, we've stayed in touch. And I will stake my entire life's work in my whole reputation that you can bank on this guy living the rest of his life one day at a time as the man that he is today. And 
And I said, I told Judge, I told Governor DeSantis that because of a 12 step program, you know, and God is of my, of my own understanding. And a judge called, named only J. Southby. I got a new chance in life. And uh, in closing, 30 second story. Guy named, I was watching TV with my daughter. And uh, a lot of, see a lot of spiritual stuff on TV. You got to look real hard. But as a guy, he was on TV, and they had an earthquake in, Ar in Armenia. And they don't build buildings in Armenia the, the way they build them out in California. And stuff. This city was destroyed. It was absolutely destroyed. And that morning, that, son, that father had walked his son to school and left him at the steps of school and went back to work a few blocks away. But that, that during that earthquake, he dr drug himself out of the rubble of the building that he was in. And started running three blocks where that school was. And he got there, it was just a pile of stuff. And he ran to the top of the pile. He started throwing rocks and throwing bricks and screaming his son's name, Armand, Armand, Armand. And people would come to him and say, you're, you're, you're hurt, you're bleeding, let us bandage you, let us help you. And he'd scream, help me find my son. Help me find my son. And they'd say, we can't help him. And they'd go and help somebody else. 36 hours later, he was still there screaming and yelling out his son's name. After 36 hours, he heard something. And he said, Armand, is it you? And he heard, yes, father, it's me. He said, son, are you all right? He heard, yes, father, I'm all right. There are 13 of us in here. I told them that if my father is alive, he will not rest until he saves me. And after he helps me, he'll help you too. I want you new guys to know here in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, as the big book declares, we have a father. We have a heavenly spiritual father. And it's my testimony today to you that he will not rest until he saves you. He will not rest until he reaches you, and he will not rest until he helps you. And after he helps you, he wants to use you to help somebody else. And I love you guys. Thank you for helping me. Stay sober today.